So good morning. We're, we're about to get started. I know people are still coming in, but we um, have a very filled day, so I thought it best to get underway. So let me welcome you to the first annual symposium of the Stanford Journal of Complex Litigation. Uh, we have a number of distinguished scholars and panelists and practitioners involved in the, the litigation that forms the topic of the day. And we have our faculty here and uh, Bay attorneys and our students. And before I say a few words of introduction about the topic, I'd like to thank a few people. First, um, our, the deans, our former Dean Kramer and Dean McGill, Kathy Glaze, Julie Yee, who works in the journal office, uh, Judith Rogers, who works with publicity, our faculty who have involved, Deborah Hensler, Nora and David Engstrom, Bert Newborn, Norm Spaulding, Janet Martinez, and Jenny Martinez, and our students, and the entire journal staff in particular, Anuja Thaddy, who is the symposium director and, and emailed many of you to set up hotel and flight accommodations, and so thank you to her for that. Today's events will run from 9 until 5.30, at which point we'll have a reception for anyone who has stuck it through the day. And we will have serve a lunch at 12.45 that will be out here. Today's events will be videotaped, and we're also live blogging it on Letters Blogatory. Um, and that, if you have internet access, you can look at throughout the day. And, and on the subject of internet access, I'm told for guest users who are seeking to log on, simply hit Stanford Guest, launch a browser, and it will walk you through that. The old system, if for some reason it prompts you that, the username and password are law school, law school. And one other logistical matter, if you come up to speak at one of the, the question microphones, please just identify yourself before asking a question. <coughs> So as you know, today's topic, well I hope you know, today's topic is the, the litigation involving Texaco, now Chevron, in Ecuador. And the, the environmental suit that, that came out of that. And so I, I certainly will not do the case and its history of full, uh, the, the justice it deserves because I'm going to try to speak only briefly and then turn it over to the people who have been litigating these, this case, or these cases. But just for those of you who are less familiar with the litigation, a brief background. In 1964, Texaco began exploration for oil in, northern, in the northern part of Ecuador, in an area occupied principally by indigenous peoples. And in 1972, when production began, Texaco teamed with Petro Ecuador, which ultimately worked with Texaco in 1990, until 1993, when it took exclusive control. In 1991, Judith Kimmerling, one of our panelists here today, authored a book highlighting the environmental and human rights issues involved in oil drilling in Ecuador. And by 1993, a class action, which I'm told drew on much that was written in her book, was filed in New York federal court on behalf of 30,000 members against Texaco, alleging that discharge of production water and oil pits contaminated the drinking water that was used for fishing and bathing by indigenous people in the area. And in 2001, that lawsuit was dismissed on forum non-convenience grounds, relying on Texaco's argument that the suit was better fought in Ecuador. And without a US forum, in 2003, the suit was refiled in Ecuador. Chevron at that point, which had assumed the liabilities of Texaco, claimed the responsibility for any damage lied with Petro Ecuador, both legally, in terms of an agreement the two entities had reached, and also in terms of the actual causation for the damage. And in 2008, a court-appointed expert issued a report finding that Texaco committed widespread pollution and estimated damages up to $27 billion. In the course of all of this, in order to finance the litigation, New York lawyer Stephen Donziger, who unfortunately is una was un unable to join us today, um, sold a portion of, of the claim to a third party financer, which you'll hear further about in today's talk. And also while this litigation was going on, there was extensive public, relation, public relations activity. Environmental activists, including Sting and his wife, toured Ecuador. Pablo Fajardo, who represented the plaintiffs in Ecuador, received a number of awards, including the Goldman Environmental Prize and the CNN Hero Award, and a documentary film crew followed the litigation and later produced a film called Crew. In 2009, 
Chevron acquired outtakes from Crude, which subsequently formed much of the basis for a RICO Act suit that was filed in New York federal court against Donziger and others who were involved in the plaintiff's case. And that RICO suit alleges a number of ethical violations, including extortion, fabrication, and fraud. And in 2009, Chevron also filed an arbitration claim against the government of Ecuador, arguing that the government failed to uphold the settlement and release of liability that had previously entered into when Chevron, or then Texaco, left the country of Ecuador. And based on those proceedings, international discovery pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 1782 was conducted. And that, again, will form a point of discussion for today's symposium. In February 2011, an Ecuadorian court ordered Chevron to pay $18 billion. And Chevron has appealed that decision, and that litigation is still pending in Ecuador. At the same time, during the pendency of that appeal, the plaintiffs have sought to enforce the judgment around the world, most notably in Canada, Argentina, and Brazil. While, while the plaintiffs were pursuing that enforcement effort, Chevron obtained an injunction in New York against the enforcement of the judgment anywhere in the world, but the Second Circuit reversed that decision in September of 2011. And on November 7th of 2012, Argentina ultimately decided to attach the assets of Chevron in the country, thus bringing this judgment enforcement issue to the forefront. Most recently, on January 28, 2013, Chevron filed an affidavit by Alberto, Alberto Guara Bastida saying plaintiff lawyers led by Stephen Donziger paid him thousands of dollars and offered $500,000 of any settlement proceeds to Judge Nicholas Zambrano if he'd allow them to ghostwrite Zambrano's ruling in the case. And that has formed the most recent press attention for the RICO suit that's going on. So out of all of this, and I've definitely left out a number of important events, which you'll hear about further in this case, it highlights a number of important questions of complex litigation, which is, of course, what this symposium is about. And those include the role of class actions in achieving environmental justice and human rights, forum non-convenience issues, the issues of judgment enforcements internationally, the role of third-party funding, international arbitration, the discovery that comes with it, legal ethics, the use of RICO suits, the reach of re legal ethics rules internationally, and many others. And those topics are the topics of today's events. So without saying more, I'd like to turn over the conference to Deborah Hensler. And, and Professor Deborah Hensler needs little introduction, especially here at Stanford Law School, but if, if she'll indulge me for a second just to give one. Professor Hensler is the Judge John W. Ford Professor of Dispute Resolution and Associate Dean for Graduate Studies here. She uh, was once the director of the RAND Corporations Institute for Civil Justice. She's testified before state and federal legislators. I think she's probably spoken to anyone ever involved with asbestos litigation anywhere in the country. Uh, she's the organizer of the Stanford Globalization of Class Action Exchange. The Globalization of Class Actions is something that she co-edited. It's a book. And she also recently co-authored Class Action Dilemmas, Pursuing Public Goals for Private Gain. And I'd like to now turn the microphone over to her and, and to our first panelist, and Deborah Hensler. So thanks very much. I, I want to add to Nick's welcome of all of you, particularly all of you who have come from a distance, all of you who have been involved in this long running case, to join with us in considering the implications of this litigation for transnational litigation going forward. Um, I will indulge myself for a moment in congratulating Matt and Nick for organizing this conference. And, and Nick, you get another honors for my class in transnational litigation for managing to sum up this incredibly complicated litigation in a relatively short time and in as neutral a fashion as possible. Um, what we're going to do now for the morning session is hear serially from some of the key litigators, lawyers involved in this case. Um, and each of them is going to come up and speak for a half hour. 
and then we'll pause and there'll be 15 minutes for questions and then we'll move on to the next speaker. And after we have had an opportunity to hear all three of our morning speakers, hopefully there'll be a little more time for additional questions. And I'm sure that the issues that are raised in the morning sessions will come back in the panels that Nick has described as the day goes on. Now, most of you know, and those of you who heard the description of this case for the first time uh, should have gathered, this has been a very hard fought case with many charges and counter charges, not just about the parties in the case, but about the lawyers in the case. So it was with some trepidation that I agreed to actually moderate uh, this panel. And I have spoken briefly with each of our three morning speakers, and I have asked them to the extent possible to avoid litigating the case before us. This is a case that occupies most of these people's, um, all of their time, at least all of their uh, professional uh, time, or much of it. And it is difficult for them to share uh, their perspectives with us, of course, without referring to the litigation, as they all told me when I chatted with them. But my hope is that this morning, each of them will talk to us about the subject of this um, um, symposium, which was what lessons should we draw from the Chevron so with that as background, I want to first invite Graham Erian to come up and talk with us. Graham is a Canadian lawyer. He's licensed in Ontario and New York, and he is currently working full time on the enforcement litigation associated with the litigation. He has an LLM from Columbia uh, University, and he worked at a number of Canadian firms before uh, becoming involved in this case. He first became involved in this litigation, he tells us, as an intern in the Quito Office of Plaintiff's Counsel in Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and I, I will uh, uh, repeat your gratitude to the organizers. I was telling them last night about how when I was a law student, which was not too long ago, uh, I had to organize just one panel in a symposium and ended up blowing the entire symposium's budget by about tenfold. Uh, so I know what it's like to try to get a bunch of people in a room together. Um, and it's certainly not easy. Um, I thought I would start today with uh, a word from one of my clients. Uh, none of them are here, obviously. And I think it's, it's really easy in all of the things that happen in this litigation to lose the voice of the people who this litigation is about. And the person who I'd like to share with you is actually Maria Aginda. Uh, Maria is now 63 years old. She's a grandmother. She's a, uh, a wonderful spirit. She was 22 uh, when the oil concession began operating in, in, her, uh, in her land, and she was 46, I believe, uh, actually 43, when she was listed as the first name in the, uh, in the case that was filed in New York in 1993. And she told a reporter recently, and I quote, when Texaco came, we never thought they would leave behind such damage, never. Then it began to drill a well and set up burn pits. It changed our life. Hunting, fishing, and other food. It's all finished. She concluded, before I die, they have to pay me for the dead animals and for what they did to the river, the water, and the earth. And as I said, I think we're going to have a lot of fascinating conversations. I think one thing that all of the litigators at least agree on is that this is probably one of the most fascinating cases in the world. 
But let's not lose sight of the voice of Maria Aginda and why we're here. And why we're here is that Texaco, and I'm, I'm going to use Texaco and Chevron interchangeably. Hopefully, we're not relitigating that issue, and that's been litigated <laughs> plenty. Um, but Texaco made deliberate decisions that, their, that Maria and, and 30,000 other inhabitants, that their lives were, had no value. This is not a case about an accident. This is a case about a corporate decision that said it's a lot cheaper to pollute the environment than to protect the environment, and we think we can get away with it. And we've been litigating this case for 20 years to try to change that calculation. And I think the lesson of that is one that I hope can inform our discussions today. That this case is obviously about cleaning up the world's worst oil contamination. But we also hope that it can be about changing the calculations that are made in boardrooms, even today, that says, we think it's cheaper to pollute than to protect and we bet we can get away with it. And a $19 billion judgment says, maybe you can, but if you're wrong, it's gonna cost a lot more than it would have if you had done the right <coughs> protection, the right operation in the first place. I think another lesson I wanna draw upon today is really, one of perseverance and victory. When Mr. Boutros gets up, I'm sh quite sure that he's not going to agree with me that this is a victory. Or maybe he thinks it's a victory for his clients. But make no mistake, this case is a victory for Maria Aginda and the, the indigenous and settler communities in Ecuador who have brought this. They have won the trial. They have won the appeal. We just won last week in Argentina to keep the freeze order in place. We are winning this case. And they are, as Maria said, before I die, they have to pay me for what they did. You know, Chevron says, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna fight this until hell freezes over and then we're gonna fight it out on the ice. But if you wanna talk about perseverance and if you wanna talk about where this case is, I'm from Canada. I know what ice looks like. I live in front of a lake. It's frozen. And we're on the ice right now. And that's where this case is being fought. In terms of other key lessons I want us to take away from this is I think this case also represents a victory for a new model of litigation. Recall that in 1993 when this case was filed, it was filed under the Aliens Tort Statute. And I think there's a case that casts a pretty tall shadow over our proceedings today, and that's the Coble decision, which is expected, I guess, in months, sometime before June, I believe, from the Supreme Court. And they may kill ATS through saying it doesn't apply to corporate defendants. They may kill it through saying that the jurisdictional arguments don't, uh, uh, don't hold up. Maybe they keep it alive. But assuming that, that they don't, assuming that, that that Cobalt loses, this model of litigating in the country where the violations occurred and then taking that judgment and, enforce, and recognizing and enforcing it, this is the future of human rights litigation. I think there's also an important model here about indigenous rights and indigenous struggle and giving, giving voice and power and leverage to communities that really are considered to be valueless, at least by uh, corporate defendants. Um, but I think with your indulgence, uh, in deference to Professor Kimmerling, who has done incredible work on the indigenous issues in Ecuador, I, 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 I will uh, defer to her or to the questions and answers uh, for, for how the, the, uh, how, what this case says about indigenous rights. I think another lesson that we can take from this case is the dangers of form shopping. Uh, at dinner last night, uh, Professor Gomez, who's sitting in front of me, told me when he teaches a class on this case, he uses the phrase, uh, form shoppers regret. 
uh, which I told him I would steal because I think it's uh, a, a, you know, the, the modern version of uh, buyer's remorse in transnational litigation. And undoubtedly, uh, Chevron does uh, regret the form shopping to Ecuador. But I think the other form shopping that has happened in this case, the bringing the case back to the United States, the arbitration award, which we'll talk about since you know, the, the fourth interim award was released yesterday, which had all the illegitimacy of the third, second, and first that preceded it. But we've, we've set up a system where, in the name of protecting defendants, we're actually allowing, through form shopping, an incredible amount of abuse by defendants. And if human rights litigation is going to have a future, we need to find ways to contain the ability of a defendant to take more and more bites out of the same apple. And lastly, I think there's a lesson to learn here from, as uh, Professor Hensler said, what has happened to the lawyers. The, 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 this new model of defending corporate human rights abuses, which is not about the merits, but which is about trying to separate the lawyers from the victims. And so not only is it sufficient now to defend your clients, but you, have to, you are forced to defend yourself. And I think that this is a very dangerous model and one we have to examine very carefully. Now, I thank Nick for the, the introduction about the case. And so I, uh, I don't want to spend much time uh, going through sort of the last 50 years. And I notice I have 20 more minutes, so I don't even think I could. Um, but I do want to make clear that first point I came to, that this is about, this case is about deliberate decisions to kill people, to, to, to maybe not directly, but, but knowingly contaminate. You know, you, you go back, yeah, as, as Nick said, the, 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 the Texaco started uh, operating the concession in 1972. And they really made four key decisions. And I'll go through them quickly. The first one was to dump the toxic produced water into the streams. I, uh, I thought I'd bring today, I don't have a PowerPoint slide, but I, I, I wanted to make sure that you know, there is some documentary evidence. A patent from 1974, uh, the patent is described as a method of disposing certain process effluent waste streams by injecting them into subterranean formations. Why is this needed? These streams must be disposed of, but to dispose of them near or on the surface of the earth may cause considerable pollution problems. Again, 1974. <coughs> Who owned this patent? Texaco Inc. of New York, New York. So not only was the, re the, 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 the dumping of production water banned in, and let me get this right, 1940 uh, in Texas, but by 1974, Texaco had patents on how to re-inject this. And they knew it was polluting, and they didn't do it once. You know, we're going to talk, I'm sure, a lot about fraud today. But one thing that Chevron's lawyers can't deny, because they admitted at trial, 16.8 billion gallons were intentionally dumped. They were not re-injected. That was a production decision, which has resulted in an epidemic of cancers. And that was a deliberate decision. In terms of not just dumping, but spills, there's also been memos uncovered where the chairman of the board is saying, and I quote, only major events as per the spill response plan instructions are to be reported. Major uh, event is further defined as one which attracts media attention. And finally, no reports are to be kept on a routine basis, and all previous reports are to be removed from the field and destroyed. These were the decisions that were being made. And finally, perhaps the most famous one, the decision to not line a thousand pits. Um, again, in, uh, in Texas in 1939, the practice of leaving unlined waste pits in oil drilling was banned. In, uh, in the 1950s, uh, Texaco had drilling permits in Texas and Louisiana that prohibited the practice of leaving waste in unlined pits. And even they knew this because we, we, we had, we were talking earlier, one of the gentlemen here, 
about the discovery process and the very limited discovery that the, uh, uh, the plaintiffs were able to have in this case. But even then, they were able to locate a memo from 1980 where Texaco had conducted a study on the necessity of eliminating these pits. They were getting pressure from the Republic of Ecuador to do so. And they said, uh, the current pits are necessary for the efficient and economical operation of our drilling and workover programs. And the alternative would be to use steel pits at, quote, a prohibitive cost. The total cost of eliminating the old pits and lining new pits would be $4,197,000. So that's, we're going to talk about $19.04 billion, which is actually the, the, the executed amount of the judgment. But every time we talk about that $19 billion number, I want you to remember $4.1 million, because that was the calculation that was made. And that, I think, is one of the key lessons of this case, is to try to make sure not just Texaco, but other companies, when they get memos like this that say, this is a prohibitive cost to protect the environment, it's going to cost $4 million, bucks, they think of $19 billion. Um, now, just briefly on the, uh, on the trial, and again, Nick, Nick uh, summarized this quite well, and I, and I look forward to the discussions that are going to, uh, to reoccur uh, this afternoon and, and this morning about, about what happened in this really an epic 20-year litigation. Um, but I think that there's some lessons to be learned from this trial, and certainly the one from, from New York, uh, where it was dismissed on form non-convenience, and I know we have a, a, a separate panel on that today. But let's not remember, or, or let us remember rather, that, that Texaco and eventually Chevron Texaco not just said Ecuador is the better form because the evidence was there, but they said Ecuador is the better form because we filed 14 expert affidavits saying that Ecuador is independent, that their judiciary is outstanding, that we can get a fair and impartial hearing in Ecuador. That, that there would be no difference between litigating this case in Ecuador and litigating in the United States. And when they, the, the case was finally released there, on this basis, Chevron Texaco signed a release saying, we will abide by the jurisdiction of the Ecuadorian courts, subject to the New York Foreign Judgment Money Recognition Act defenses, and we will waive the statute of limitations. And on May 16th, 2003, the first day of trial, the first thing that Chevron's lawyer said, this was less than a 14 months from when the case left, and they signed a release saying we will abide by the jurisdiction of the Ecuadorian courts. The first thing they said is that this court does not have jurisdiction over us. The second thing they said was this case is barred by the statute of limitations. And they've continued to say this. Chevron just released its uh, 10Q uh, last, uh, er, uh, on Monday about the fourth quarter earnings. And every time they talk about the case, they say, and I quote, as to matters of law, the company believes that the court lacks jurisdiction over Chevron. Second, that the law under which the plaintiffs bring the action enacted in 1999 cannot be applied re retroactively. That's already been litigated three times and they've lost. And third, that the claims are barred by the statute of limitations. That's John Watson. You know, if we want to talk about fraud in this case, let's also talk about securities fraud. Let's also talk about the fact that just yesterday, a judge allowed investor claims against BP to go ahead, and particularly their former chief executive officer, about statements he made about the scope of their safety program. Maybe that's a lesson that we want to take from that case. And then, outside of sort of the, the form shopping legal arguments and arguing whatever is convenient in whatever jurisdiction you are without any sort of desire to have any kind of consistency or really a mechanism to force that consistency, I think just on the facts alone and the evidence alone, this is one of the most overwhelming, uh, the, 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 the scope of the evidence in this trial is almost unprecedented. I mean, we're talking about a, a trial record that goes for 216, 692,000 pages. It takes a long time to read. We're talking about 62,000 chemical samples, 50, over 50,000 of which were submitted by Chevron. You know, 
the, the 56 judicial inspections, 106 expert reports. I mean, I can, you can just, you know, it's like a Harper's Index of, of evidence and due process. And during this trial, the, 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 the plaintiffs knew not only was the evidence, their evidence in their favor and showed exactly what had happened and, and, and again, the, the dumping and, and the, the, um, the spills and, and the, the pits were undisputed, but also Chevron's evidence was proving their case for them. You know, I don't know if we're gonna get into the battle of outtakes, but Chevron likes to talk about a certain smoke mirrors and if I can say bullshit in a Stanford Law School, as somehow our admission that our case didn't mean anything. In fact, if you watch that whole quote, what they're talking about is we've already won. We've already proved our case. They've already proved our case for us. The evidence is overwhelming. We continue to litigate, but we could go to trial today or we could go to judgment today. And there's more than enough evidence in the record 10 times over for us to win this case. Um, I want to turn quickly uh, to, to the other effect of this sort of, you know, saying whatever's convenient in different forms, just in the case of what's happening with enforcement, which is more of uh, my current bailiwick. And what we have is this interesting uh, dynamic where, as Nick alluded to, Chevron went, ran to Judge Kaplan and, and in, in the eloquent words of uh, Mr. Boutros's colleague, Randy Mastro, said, the sort of Democles isn't just over us, it's touching our forehead and we need this global protection because our, our assets could be frozen anywhere. They, they're they're gonna go around the world and, and grab, uh, grab our ships and, and grab our rigs and, and grab our assets. And of course that got lifted and we filed the enforcement actions and what was the first thing they said? These aren't our assets. You know, we're having a fight in Canada right now because they want to they want to show, force the court to say that you have to establish the presence of the defendant's assets in the jurisdiction before you even have standing for a recognition act. But of course, these were the same assets that apparently were being threatened by com the company and what, precisely why they needed a global injunction to protect them. You know, I, I don't have the time to go through the litany of examples of where in one jurisdiction, one argument works. In another jurisdiction, the exact opposite argument works. And we don't really have a way other than to tell the judge uh, to contain that. Maybe I'll just say one other thing about uh, a lesson we've learned from enforcement, uh, or at least the, the, the enforcement actions underway to date, and that is uh, Chevron's been very consistent in the, the claims they make about our efforts to recognize the judgment, namely that any country that respects the rule of law will not respect this judgment. I think that's pretty much verbatim. But I would actually like to praise for a second Argentina's courts for respecting the rule of law. They, 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 I, I believe they were brave last week when they upheld the freeze order on Chevron's assets and, and upheld an ex escrow account which has tens of millions of dollars in it right now, despite the pressure that was placed on them, despite the multiple full page newspaper ads put out about how this ruling could destroy the country's energy security, despite uh, oil friendly ministers coming out and giving big speeches about what the court should do, despite the multiple attempts at ex parte contact, despite the, the, the attempt to recuse the judge that, 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 that issued the order which, by the way, was the seventh time Chevron's tried to recuse a judge in this case since it was filed in Ecuador. They went six for six in Ecuador, and now they've tried a seventh one in Argentina. We have gone, if you look at the countries we have gone into, we have gone into countries that respect the rule of law because that is precisely why we think this judgment's gonna be recognized. We are not going into countries we may, who knows what happens, and I'm certainly not at liberty nor have any desire to reveal our litigation strategy. But we have, we have been very conscious to be in countries where we believe are going to be immune from the pressure that our adversaries put on them, and make no mistake, they do put pressure on, our, on those jurisdictions. And so if we want to talk about the rule of law, 
I think there's some interesting lessons we can draw from that. And finally, let me, I know we're going to have a, a panel on, uh, on the arbitration, but I, uh, I want to briefly uh, just mention this because, of course, we have our, our fourth interim award that came out yesterday. Uh, our position has been and, and always will be uh, that we're not a party to these proceedings. The, we have no standing in these proceedings, uh, and therefore they have no uh, bearing on both the proceedings underway in Ecuador and the cassation appeal that's being heard there, as well as our, uh, our, our efforts to, to have the judgment recognized. But I do want to say a few brief words just to, to frame that. Um, and I think not only do we see this as having nothing to do with us and, and illegitimate, but we also believe the Ecuadorian government was right to see it that way as well. Uh, the U.S. government has an established policy that, that uh, be, it, be it the International Court of Justice or, or be it an arbitration panel, cannot tell its executive to interfere in its judiciary. That is the established policy of this country, and yet this is precisely what we're asking the Ecuador government to do. So why is the separation of powers and the constitutional protections good enough in, in, in the United States and yet somehow gets tossed out of the window in Ecuador. Hopefully we can address that question today. I also think that this goes back to the dangers of this form shop. You know, we're, 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 we're litigating a release, uh, the, the, the validity of a release of the Republic of Ecuador, which was litigated in the United States. This was brought up when the case was in the Southern District. This was litigated in Ecuador. This was litigated at the Ecuador Court of Appeal. It is part of the cassation appeal. And yet somehow these domestic court processes don't matter because you can go to The Hague and have a private panel that says, Let us rule, let's rule on this without the plaintiffs there, without any merits of the underlying dispute, without any discussion of human rights. You know, I, 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 I'm not against the system of commercial arbitration. I think it's very important. But I think in this case, this is being well beyond what the scope should be of these tribunals. And lastly, and I got five, ten? Five. Five. All right. I'm going to be quick on this then. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on in the United States. And I think the form to look at what's happening in the United States is what we would call, well, actually, we won't use our term. Our term is the fraud template. Their term is uh, the kill step. And we're uncovering now what is really a, a pre-baked fraud defense. And it's pre-baked uh, by my colleagues here who are going to speak after me. And you can go on their website. And this is advertised. And we're, I want to keep this respectful, but we now have what I believe is a real threat to human rights litigation by defense counsel that markets themselves as, and I quote, more than a series of defensive tactics, but rather an affirmative strategy to ultimately end the litigation. There was an article in The American Lawyer where they talked about this strategy, a strategy of action and not reaction. Partner Bragg that, quote, from day one on a, another case, not our case, but nonetheless before any evidence was in, he viewed the case as the prosecution of a massive fraud and not the routine defense of a lawsuit. This template was born out of the Dole and Dow Chemical case. We're beginning to, to see some of the same players that were sent to Nicaragua to investigate these claims, which we are now seeing was to offer, quite frankly, bribes and relocations to Costa Rica or various other luxurious, luxurious destinations in return for false testimony. That false testimony was then part of, became secret witnesses that came to California. It seemed that initially to exceed, succeed in California. And then it was shipped over to Florida, where things got a little bit more difficult. But this template of accusing the lawyers of fraud 
launch massive litigation, try to get the lawyers off of the case, and then settle for pennies on the dollar, existed before this Ecuador case, existed before Gibson Dunn came on to this Ecuador case, and I would uh, submit to you, and, and Mr. Boutros can confirm or deny this, that this was exactly the model that was, that was offered to Chevron to have Gibson Dunn run this case. And the tactics we are seeing are right out of the Nicaragua case. And, and if I had more time and this was on the doubt, if this was a symposium on a different case, we'd go into those details and, and maybe uh, others can address those. But what we're seeing with this fraud template applied in Ecuador is largely the same. It starts with, with a form non-convenience dismissal where a defendant says, I would rather litigate there. And then it says, we're going to take some differences in that system and then exploit them as somehow representative of the invalidity of an entire trial. In Ecuador, the example was, in Ecuador you have to, uh, the court can order both sides to pay the expenses of a court-appointed expert and work with that court-appointed expert. The judge in Ecuador, the average judge salary, I believe, is between $3,000 and $3,600 a month. These are not people who have the resources to pay expensive court-appointed experts, but if both sides pay them, so be it. We cooperated, they didn't. We met with the expert, they didn't. And now this is being presented to, to courts in the United States, which may not be as familiar with Ecuadorian civil procedure as somehow fraudulent. I would point to an appellate ruling in Philadelphia that said, though it is obvious that the Ecuadorian judicial system is different from that in the United States, those differences provide no basis for disregarding or disparaging that system. American courts, though justifiably proud of our system, should understand that other countries may organize their judicial systems as they see fit. But in the, in the kill step, that doesn't fit into that narrative. Those differences are actually fraud. Okay. So, um, I mean, I think we can get into how that fraud template applied. I'm happy to, to, to address any questions about, as Nick mentioned, the, the, the Guerra, uh, the, the, the latest paid witness. Um, but what I want to leave you with is that I believe that this strategy of litigating or defending human rights claims is something we should all be very concerned about. When you sue somebody for $57 billion, I think that can be considered an act of intimidation. But it's not just an act of intimidation on us. I think the intention is an act of intimidation on human rights uh, defenders in general. The message being sent to the human rights community, to, to even students in this room who may consider uh, this profession, is that if you come after us, not only are we going to go after your clients, but we're going to go after you as well. That hasn't won in our case. Maybe it won in Nicaragua. It's not going to win in our case. We're, we're fighting this out on the ice. But I want, I, I, it's a necessary conversation to have. It's, I believe it's necessary to expose these tactics. And I hope that we uh, are given the opportunity to do so today and, and, uh, and in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you. Come down sure, to yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, we've demonstrated, I think, that um, it's very difficult to talk about this case without <laughs> litigating uh, this case. Um, we have a couple of questions from the audience already, so I'm going to uh, turn to those, and Howie, I'll call on you first. Okay, um, um, Howard Erickson. Yeah, in, in discussing this case with my students, one of the things that, that they struggled with, and, um, and I think it's a really hard question about plaintiff's lawyering in this case, is, is to what extent do you adjust when you're thrown into a different system? So, you know, you guys, I know you weren't involved in the early days, but you're part of the plaintiff's team, and I'm interested in your thoughts. You start out wanting to litigate in the U.S., where things are relatively clean and relatively orderly, and you get thrown out and told you've got to litigate in this other place, and you say, we don't want to litigate in that other place. It's, it's messier, it's dirtier, it's not our choice. 
but that's what you're stuck with, and there you have to litigate. And you know, it, it you know, you're used to driving on American roads. Mm -hmm. you, you drive in another country, you have to adjust a bit to the norms. Mm -hmm. you shop mm -hmm. in the market in another country, you adjust to the norms. But what's really hard in this case is, suppose another legal system isn't as clean, isn't as orderly as the US. To what extent do you adjust to the norms and play the game the way it's played there? And to what extent do you kind of hold fast to certain, a certain kind of ethical orderliness that we assume here? I find that a hard question. I don't think there's a neat answer to that. But I'm really interested in, in your thoughts as, as part of the team. Yeah, I think that's, that is a very hard question. And I think, I think it's, it's a question that um, really demands a certain context. I think, I think when the case was refiled there, you know, there was, if, if you looked at what, what our side put into the record in New York, it, there, was a, there was a deeply held concern that, that this was a judiciary that could be corrupted by, by, by Chevron. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that the, the, the adjustment was one of, of villages, was, was one of, of, of trying to, you know, really keep an eye uh, on the proceedings and and ensure the courts knew that we were doing that. You know, uh, one of the examples or one of the outtakes that Chevron loves to use is Mr. Donziger saying all judges in Ecuador are corrupt, uh, which was certainly uh, a moment of frustration. But again, if you watch the whole clip, uh, and I actually, let me, let, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you the exact quote. Um, he actually was saying that, that we, we're going down to confront this judge that we believe is being paid by Texaco. Uh, and we're going to, uh, uh, we are going to let him know basically that we know, sorry, what, what we're going to do now is we're going down and we're going to confront the judge who we believe is paid by Texaco. We believe he is corrupt and we're going to confront him with our suspicions about his corruption and let him know what time it is. And I think, you know, do you have to do that in the United States? No. But when you have a, a, a counterparty who's paying, and this was a judge in Quito who, who was basically paid to, to, inter, to, to try to shut down the, the plaintiff's lab that was processing samples. When, when you're in a situation like that, you know, going down and saying, you, have, you are illegitimate, this, is, this, is, this ruling is illegitimate, and you can't do this, is something you have to do. And if that wasn't done, you know, does that make, does that mean this is something that we would do in the United States? No, and Stephen Donziger said this is not something you would do in the United States. But I also have yet to see any evidence or any, any and, and would not assume that the tactics that were put in against us would be done in the United States either. So, you know, you do have to adjust. Uh, but I think, I think, Keeping, you know, keeping your moral compass uh, is obviously important. I think that's, that's something that we did. So, so let me push you a little on this point because you described um, the litigation as a model for litigation of this sort. Now, you refer to it generally as, as human rights litigation, but we're really talking about a particular genre of human rights litigation. This is not the Holocaust litigation. No. This is not reparations litigation on behalf of African Americans. So we're talking about a case that arises, at least from my perspective, from environmental uh, damage claims uh, associated with petro the products, petroleum yeah. uh, industry. So that's an industry that you know better than I is concentrated in certain parts of the world, many of which are not, not dem democracies or they're mm -hmm. developing democracies. They are poor countries, and many, although not all of those countries, have authoritarian governments and leaders who are clearly subject to all kinds of blandishments, uh, including bribery. Um, so as, as we look around the world and we look at these different jurisdictions where these activities take place, 
and where if there were a judgment as you have in Ecuador that you're trying to enforce, uh, this would be, these would be the places presumably where you would go to enforce the judgment. If, if I were plaintiff's attorney, um, believing in my case, mm -hmm. as you clearly do, I wouldn't see this as a very uh, rosy proposition because while you may have succeeded to date in a few jurisdictions, it seems to me there's at least an equally large possibility that you would not succeed mm -hmm. in other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can step back from the case a little and you know your position obviously that the judgment you have from Ecuador is a proper judgment and that you ought to be able to enforce it and think about some other litigation and then picking up on Howie's point, is this really a strategy? that you think we ought to be recommending to people who are concerned about uh, remediating damage, mm -hmm. preventing mm -hmm. damage, and corporate deterrence, which was the point where you started. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I'm not sure if, if I was necessarily recommending this model. I think I was saying that this is, this may be the, the recommendation by default. Right, that, that if, if COBOL comes down and you cannot go after corporate malfeasance in the developing world in the United States, then what other form do you have? Um, and I think, I think that there are, you know, there's obviously huge jurisdictional challenges to having cases heard in the United States, and there's obviously going to be huge uh, challenges to having a fair case heard in the countries that, that, that you mentioned. Um, so no, this is this is not easy litigation anywhere. Um, but I think that I, I, I think that this model, I think it has worked in Ecuador, and I think that I'm, I'm I mean maybe I'm just young and idealistic, which I'm sure will be corrected very shortly. Um, but I but I think that. That there has to be there has to be some form of recourse for the type of environmental damage and, and, and contamination that, that that we see these corporations doing, and and the, the the local judiciary may be the place to start, but I I think I take the the larger point where no matter what happens, it's probably not the place where it ends, and and if the United States isn't the starting point. And it has to be the, the Ecuador's or the Nigeria's or the Angola's. Um, you know, I, I, I do hope that there is, through at least the recognition process or, or, or another, uh, uh, you know, alternative forms that can kind of supplement those decisions and, and give them, you know, if, if there's questions of legitimacy, uh, resolve those in, in more of an impartial manner. Right. Hi, I'm Rick Marcus. I think I'm the guy who pestered yeah. you about this subject yeah. that I'm going to bring up again and <laughs> uh, talk about this afternoon, and maybe Mr. Boutrous can give us some insights from a different perspective. Uh, the subject is American discovery yeah. and whether that's urgently needed or essential for plaintiffs to have a chance. Um, and a related subject to my mind is forum non and uh, the attraction of using U.S. courts. Uh, the combined question I'm interested in your commenting on is the extent to which you found the absence of discovery in what I'll guess is a sort of civil law system in Ecuador mm -hmm. to impede your ability to get evidence since you said, gee, we've got an enormous quantity of evidence to prove them guilty a thousand times over. Mm -hmm. Uh, and related to that, I wonder if you'd reflect on whether having initiated a case in the U.S., which was eventually dismissed on forum non, actually produced any benefits to the plaintiffs at all. Sometimes conditions for forum non dismissal uh, might seem to be a lure to suing here. Even if you get thrown out, you'll get some payoff. 
Maybe the payoff, as in Bhopal, could be some form of discovery, or you get some discovery before that. So I see these two as related, and I guess I'm sort of interested in your case, but don't know that much about it. I know a whole lot more about U.S. debates about whether discovery should be altered here, <laughs> uh, and I'm interested in what you, light you can shed on those, which is what I was asking about before, and I'm still asking about. Yeah. Uh, well, v very briefly, um, we did we did have some we had some limited discovery in the United States, and, and the, the documents that I, I, I shared earlier were a product of that. Okay, that's where those came from. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's I think that's in in my case I can't necessarily speak to to the the, the Dole and, and Bhopal ones, uh, but 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 in our case. That discovery sort of helped show that this was sort of getting behind the intention, right? It's in their words. I mean, you know, the, there's all these fraud allegations, but you know, I don't. I've yet to see anybody dispute their own internal documents that say we're not doing this because it's going to cost four million dollars. But if we didn't have that, we still had that they did it. We still had it's still there. Uh, I don't know what he looks like, but Patrick Keefe is in this room, and while I disagreed with some of the things he put in his article, I respected him for being a journalist who actually went down to Ecuador and actually saw it, and, and you, can, you can ask him. Uh, so I think in, in our case, it might have been a little bit more um, specific in, insofar as, you know, we won our case on, 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 on judicial inspections and the judge seeing the pollution with his own eyes. Um, but I do think that, that the absence of discovery, if this is the model, that may be another, another drawback because I do think that, that even the limited documents we got were sort of helpful in showing, uh, I guess, motive more than, than the, 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 the mens rea over the actus reus. The actus reus was, is, is still on the ground. 